the end of time. So we all know that the most important day of the liturgical year is what? Easter. Easter. Second most important day is? We have preparation periods for both of those highlights of the year, right? Mm -hmm. So the preparation period for Christmas is? And, 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 and we're properly attired in our one, two, three and a half people have their <laughs> advent colors on. Half a person. Sorry, <laughs> sorry that you're a half a person, David, but. <laughs> so Advent starts Advent starts at the first week of December, four weeks of preparation for Christmas. Oh my god, I'm starting off. I'm sleeping. Advent has Advent means what? Preparation. For what? There's two things we're preparing for. The little kids can get the first one pretty easy. Santa Claus. Santa Claus, that's right. St. Nicholas is up here, guys. That ain't going to make it. So the obvious, cho obvious choice of preparation for the birth of Christ. What is the actual other preparation for? The end. The end. The second. The coming. The second coming. Second coming. I think I've listened to this about five times. I know. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, the important part is this. We can't prepare for this one. It's already happened. It's history. We have to prepare for this one. Tragically, we don't know when our life as a human on earth is going to end and our life, hopefully our eternal life is going to begin. So we need to be prepared. So we go through this liturgical, and you know, we'll talk about Advent maybe a little bit more in depth at our next session. But the liturgical year follows the life of Christ. Preparing for his birth, <coughs> preparing for his death, celebrating how to live life without Jesus in the um, Easter period, ordinary time, we celebrate his, his actual day-to-day -day life. The last Sunday of the year is what? November something. November something. Very important day. Today, Father Matthew... Our Father Augustine is going to go, today is November, the Feast of November something. No, that is not the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> is it close? Not even close. Christ the, Christ the King is the last Sunday of the year. Why? We're celebrating, we're celebrating that Christ is the King. And you've heard me tell a story before. That was always, I went to an all-boys high school in Portland, Oregon. And the bishop would always come that week and say Mass. It was the one time in the year he came and said Mass. And I mentioned this to Rick this week, that life was simple then. They just took a table and made it into an altar. They put it in the middle of the basketball court, and we said Mass. We didn't have a chapel, we didn't have a church, we didn't have anything. But that was, that's the way it was. So this concept of the, the last day of the year, we celebrate the triumph of, of Jesus Christ. And you're going, Lyndon, that is such a, that is a hard concept. Because as Americans, we don't want a king. We, we, we succeeded from England to go away from the monarch. So we don't really have a very good understand what, understanding what a king means. Let's go back in history. We have these feast days. And they go, gee, that must have happened 1,000 years ago or 1,500 years ago or 2,000 years ago. When do you think Christ the King was set up by the Pope as the feast day? Yeah, 
Yeah, if you, yeah, yeah. yeah I've given this talk before, so. Oh, yeah. you're, you're saying when? He was there before you. I know you were a young child in 1940 something, but it was slightly before that. I was, well, 1930, I was still there. Yeah, 1930, you were still at the 12? No, 33. Okay. Who will give me 36? Okay, 36, uh, 38. I got 30, 50. I feel like I'm at a poker game. <laughs> <laughs> it was 1925. Now, for you historians, somehow in the last two months, we've actually talked about history here more than... That's good. 1925 was... What, what was... What was, what was the scene in 1925? Depression. Pre-depression. Pre-depression, post... World War I. Yeah. The whole concept was Pope Pius XI instituted the Feast of Christ the King because he was concerned that after World War I, there was this big movement of secularism and nationalism. That doesn't sound familiar, does it? I mean, we're fighting this whole issue of secularism right now. The demise of, I was talking earlier about, you know, Catholic institutions, whether it's hospitals or schools or, you know, the government wants to do it instead of letting the, letting the, the people do it with their uh, religious affiliations. So I think this time is actually appropriate. When Christ the King, when, his, when he wrote... The, art, the, the, the article about instituting the Feast of Christ the King, he goes, that nations would see that the church has the right to freedom and immunity from the state. That leaders and nations would see that they are bound to give respect to Christ. And that the faithful would gain strength and courage from the celebration of this feast as we are reminded that Christ must reign in our heart, our minds, our wills, and our bodies. So this concept of Christ the King, I want to take one, one point here. You guys all know that this Messiah, anointed one, the preparation of the Jewish people for this king to come. They thought it was going to be royalty, a true king, that it would lead them into greatness. Right? I mean, that would be our concept, too. It wasn't going to be, a, you know, it wasn't going to be the guy who was a utility man who could play all nine positions in baseball. It was going to be the guy who could hit, hit, hit home runs. So that's why this concept of king on earth is, is challenging for us. Well, we know Christ from the past. We know his life. We know his death, and we know his resurrection. We have that through scripture. Now, this part... We can go through the whole story of our friend Pontius Pilate, and the discourse between he and Jesus, are you, are you, are you the king of the Jews, and Jesus says, yes, you, if you say so, that's, that's what I am. But his triumph was his resurrection. Now, this is the big challenge for us. How do we put Christ in a, in a sense of importance in our life? You know, what is, what is, what is the king for us? You know, what do we what do we put our life what 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 does our life depend upon? I've talked about this before. I introduce myself, you know, hey, here's what I do for a living. 
Very rarely does someone introduce themselves, hey, I'm Lyndon, I'm a Catholic. Just think about that. How many times have you ever, ever introduced yourself <coughs> that way? Think of, think of the several things you might say before you would say that you identify yourself publicly as a Catholic. Right, this occupation. And we talked about um, the Trinity. People go, I can't understand the Trinity. It's too complex. Well, if you introduce yourself as a father, a husband, and a grave digger, you know, those are three different things you are. But you're one, you're one substance. So how often do you identify yourself as Catholic or Christian? What do you put, what do you put at the top of your life? That's a challenge for us. And then Christ the King in the future is being with him in heaven. Okay? Because I think if you ask little kids, what, what does that phrase mean, Christ the King? I don't know. I don't, I, 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 I don't know what their answer would be. But it can be, but it can be, think of it at these three levels. You know the story. Is it important to you? Is it important to you every day? And then what is your goal? Any comments or questions? I, I like the way you just put that. You know the story. Is it important to you today? Are you going to talk about his throne? Okay. St. Stephen had a problem with it. All right, hey, go ahead. Thanks for reminding me of that, Tom. Go ahead. Um, he was asked, and when he gave the answer, it's Christ the King. <laughs> so, epic, and he was the first. Yeah, so St. Stephen was the first martyr. And they literally wanted to knock the crap out of him. And they, they wanted him to say no. And he would not say no. If he had said no, he would have lived. He gave his life. They gave Jesus every option to say no. He could have walked away. If he would have walked away, let's think about that. If he had walked away, how would he have gone home and talked to his, his father? Well, go ahead. Rick. Right. Well, I was just thinking about the reflection today. Uh, the breaking of the bread is something we got in our, get in our day, but it has a daily reflection every day. And basically, right after Christ's life, all the apostles fled yep. until the Holy Spirit was there. So it's not something that you're trying to understand. He's the king on your own. You have the Holy Spirit working with you to help you out of that. Because right after they were fleeing from, from the Romans, you know, right after the Holy Spirit was infused in them, many of them started dying right, you know, right and left, right after that, because they were filled with it and they believed it. And so... I, I just thought that was relevant to this. So you're saying the Holy Spirit's only for guys because all the women stay? <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, one, I'm not a good Old Testament guy. 